Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Briz Science for October 2017. A huge turnout tonight. Fantastic to see you all here. Uh, we are, of course, Briz Science, the free public lecture series on science, where we bring you not just the best scientists, but also the best communicators to share their research and findings from around the world. We're proudly supported by the University of Queensland, and in particular tonight by the School of Mathematics and Physics from University of Queensland um, as an alumni event, so particularly welcome to all of those UQ alumni who have come along as well. We are hosted here at The Edge, our event partner, part of the State Library of Queensland, uh, long-running partners, and we love being here, and there's lots of great things you can check out outside. The Edge also has on their 3D printing workshops in particular in immensely popular, so if you can find a chance to get into that, please do so. And I am your MC for this evening, Joel Gilmore. I'd also like to start by respectfully acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting tonight and pay my respect to elders both past and present. And I also want to recognise those whose ongoing efforts to protect and promote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures will leave a lasting legacy for future elders and leaders. Now tonight, we are talking physics, mathematics and the natural world and how scientists can take inspiration from the natural world and from phenomena in nature and use that when they're developing new research and also occasionally uh, other things around art and culture from both science and nature. So we have four fantastic speakers this evening who are going to present um, for um, seven or eight minutes each and then we're going to take questions at the end so there'll be lots of times for questions. Pardon me, lots of time for questions. So you hopefully picked up on the way in a little question slip, which is how we take questions at Briz Science. So you can write down your question and the Briz Science team will come and collect those afterwards, bring them up to me, and we will get through as many as we can. Alternatively, you can take your phone, log on to Twitter, and ask any questions you want there with hashtag Briz Science. But please make sure your phone is on silent. And finally, we will head outside and we have some food and drink and we'd love to continue these conversations for the rest of the evening. It'll be a chance to chat to all of our speakers for any more questions. So, our first speaker tonight, without further ado, is Associate Professor Diane Donovan, who has lectured in mathematics at the University of Queensland since 1992, producing some exceptional students, including yours truly. Um, <laughs> Her extensive research experience is focused on the application of pure mathematics to areas such as cryptography, and she's particularly interested in communicating the beauty and, pa and power of pure sciences. So could you please welcome our first speaker tonight, and the reason why I have a flower in my ear, it's not just to enhance my good looks. Please welcome Diane Donovan. Hello everyone, um, it's really great to have the opportunity to talk to you tonight and talk to you about the wonders of our natural world but also the wonders of mathematics. So as you've come in this evening, you've walked past our crocheted reef and you might have thought about how we actually constructed this reef. So. What we actually did was we took a bit of yarn and a crocheting hook and we started with a certain number of stitches, didn't really matter. But what was the important thing was that in each subsequent row, we increased the number of stitches. So for instance, we might have doubled the sixth stitch. And what's come out is this amazing structure which models what we see in the natural world. And for instance, brain coral. So the other thing that I've done is I've given you a flower this evening and I've placed this flower in some water that has some dye in it. And the plant has taken the dye up through the stem and maybe if you turn it over, you might see how that dye has moved through the petal and in most cases it has moved to the outer edge of the flower. And so what's actually going on here? 
The plant has taken the nutrients from the water, and yes, there was some um, quick gross flower stuff in the water, and it's transported it to the outer edge of the flower. Now, in growing, the flower has not only um, grown a new layer of cells, but it's increased the number of cells in the outer edges. Just like in the coral reef, as we went from one row to the next, we actually increased the number of stitches from one row to the next. And the plant has actually increased the number of cells at the outer edge. And maybe you can see that. You can see it by the dye in the actual flower. OK, so we might ask ourselves, what's actually going on here? Why is the coral, or, or why is the coral growing in this way? So mathematically, we can say, well, what the coral is doing is it's actually increasing, um, it's maximizing the surface area of the coral with respect to the volume. That's the ratio. It's maximizing that ratio. Um, and why is it doing this? Because it's maximizing the light transmission to the actual plant and minimizing self-shading within the coral. And in addition to that, what it's doing is as the, the water flows across the coral, it's creating sub-eddies. And that allows the plant to feed the coral better to flee, feed from the nutrients in the water. So it's grown in this particular way. So we might ask ourselves, um, what's actually going on here mathematically? How can we capture this nutrient transport through the plant to the edge of the plant? So we capture it mathematically by modelling these surfaces by what's called um, hyperbolic surfaces. So a good way to observe a hyperbolic surface, or in particular, a um, parabolic dish, is to think about circles of increasing radius being glued together. And as the radius increases, the surface increases. What's important here is that this surface is much like this. It's not like this. That's a straight plane, OK? And mathematically, we say that has zero curvature. It's just straight. This is the hyperbolic dish sitting here, and we say it has positive curvature. But that's not how the coral is growing. The coral is growing much more like this, which is a saddle. So it's increasing in one direction and decreasing in the other direction. And mathematically, we say, therefore, it has negative curvature. OK, so um, how, um, how can we um, study these objects? Or what's the importance of these objects? Well, we can move on and think a little bit about it in terms of, let's say, buildings. So this evening, I asked some of the people in the audience to use some Lego to construct me some buildings. And this is the sort of building that I got. But what you will see is that the sides are planes. They have zero curvature and there are at right angles to the base. Now, why do we construct um, buildings like this? It's because we can understand the forces, the stresses and the strains that are at play, and we can make sure that the forces are in equilibrium and it's not going to fall down. That's why we do it that way. However, Mother Nature doesn't necessarily do this, so here, Mother Nature has built a house for a turtle. This house has positive curvature, or non-zero curvature, certainly. 
and it's made up of interlocking pentagons and hexagons. So Mother Nature has balanced the forces within that structure and much more cleverly than us, we certainly had to stick with things that had zero curvature where we could clearly understand the stresses and the strains. Now where else do we see these sorts of things in Nate or um, one way we can understand what's going on is to study the work of Gaudi, the Spanish architect. In constructing the Bartholonian Cathedral, which is here, Gaudi wanted to build the cathedral as a lot of in interconnecting domes and arches. In order to get the roof right, to make sure that it wasn't going to fall down, he actually studied the forces by, oops, sorry guys, by hanging chains from pivotal points. And you can see that the chain forms an, arc, an inverted arch. And by doing that, Gaudi could make sure that the forces were in equilibrium, that all the forces were balanced and that the chain was going to stay static. He looked at this arch and he said, is this what I want for my roof when I invert it? If it wasn't, he hung weights on the chains and he changed the structure of the arch. But it still returned to equilibrium and the forces were still all in equilibrium. So then when he was happy, and this is an example here of the models that he built, okay, and he then inverted the arches and said, this is how I need to construct my roof. This is how I need to put it together because the forces will be in equilibrium and the um, roof will not fall down. Okay, so, and this is an example of a model he built in order to construct these uh, interlocking arches for his roof. And there's another model there. So, um, Gaudi did not use mathematics. Well, he did, but he wasn't actually thinking about it that way. He was just working with the physical properties of the chain, okay, ensuring that all his forces were in equilibrium. But mathematically, we would study this in terms of equations and make sure that we can construct buildings in which all the forces, okay, are within... Um, are in equilibrium and that the roof is not going to fall down. But you can see, if we go back to the turtle, we've got a long way to go to understand fully um, the importance of these structures and Mother Nature certainly is way ahead of us in terms of um, working out the mathematics and I would propose that Mother Nature was, in fact, the first mathematician. In fact, I would go further and I would say Mother Nature was the first female mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> OK. And I'm going to hand over to Artem, um, or Joel's going to introduce Artem, and he's going to tell you more about the mathematics. Wonderful. Thank you, Diane. So our next speaker is Dr. Artem Pulimatov, who holds a bachelor's degree from Kiev University, a PhD degree from Cornell University, and joined the School of Mathematics and Physics at UQ in 2012. His research is in the field of geometric analysis, but he's going to keep continuing this story for now. So please welcome Artem Pulimatov. Thank you, and thanks, Joe, for the introduction. So uh, I'd like to tell you today briefly about how the mathematical ideas behind the process of heat conduction uh, <coughs> sorry, can uh, <coughs> help us address and even solve some of the biggest and oldest conjectures in mathematics. So 
Let's talk about heat conduction first. Imagine that you have a metal rod, maybe a piece of wire, maybe just a metal stick, about this long, and imagine that it's cold to get out of the freezer. Now, you take a lighter and put it under the rod right in the middle, light it up. What's going to happen? Well, in the first couple of seconds, the temperature in the middle of the rod is going to be very high because the lighter is going to heat it up. Now, on the edges, the rod will still be cold. This is exactly what I have in my, um, in my picture here, represented by the red line, by the red curve. So the thick blue thing at the bottom is the rod. The red curve is the distribution of temperature at the time when we started this experiment. So as you can see, the temperature is high in the middle. That's where I keep my lighter. The temperature is low near the edges. Now that I take my lighter away, I step back and I start looking. I watch the rod and see what happens. And after a couple of minutes, the temperature is going to be distributed the way that the green curve shows us. So think about it. You have the rod. The center was very hot at first. But as you remove the lighter and let the heat distribute, the hot part became a little bit colder and gave away some of its heat to the side. Right? It's still warmer than the rest, so you have the distribution that's a bit higher in the middle and a bit colder, uh, a bit lower towards the ends. Finally, you get tired of looking at it, you pick up a book, you read a little bit, or you watch a movie on your phone, whatever you do. And um, then you look at the road again after a long time. Now, in mathematics, we'll say at time infinity, but practically that means after a couple of hours. What's going to happen? Well, you're going to find that the temperature in your rod has re redistributed evenly. The rod has forgotten that the center was hot at some point. Now, all the heat from the center has gone to the edges. Some stayed. The temperature is the same everywhere. This is how heat conduction works. And of course, mathematicians, with a little bit of help from physicists, can write down equations that describe that process. They can write down a differential equation, it's called, so a big formula, which is going to describe the distribution of heat in the rod with time, starting with this uh, red distribution here, and over time, going to the blue distribution at infinity. Now, that's heat conduction. What does it have to do with, with the old mathematical problems and all that? Well, one of the old mathematical problems is um, determining whether <coughs> a given mathematical object can be deformed into something nice, such as a sphere, using only continuous deformations. To visualize it, just imagine that you have a lump of clay in your hands. Now, it could be any shape you want. It could be something like that. Now, you can start pushing it and pulling it a little bit, and continuously, without tearing it apart, turn it into a ball. I mean, everyone who's played with Play-Doh can do that. Now, um, you cannot, however, with these continuous deformations, turn it into a donut, because you need to make a hole in the middle, and you can't do that. Similarly, you cannot turn it into a figure eight, and so on. So, the question is, asked in much greater generality, but uh, no. for now, for these purposes, we can just think of it this way. The question is, if you're given some mathematical objects and uh, some mathematical object, and you know it doesn't have a hole, can you use continuous deformations to turn it into a sphere? This question um, is better known to mathematicians as the Poincaré conjecture, and it's more than 100 years old, and nobody could solve it until recently. And the way people solved it, uh, the way people solved it was by using ideas behind heat conduction. Now remember, the mathematical equation that controls this process, the so-called heat equation, took this ugly temperature distribution, you now the spiky red thing, and over time gradually flattened it out. It made it nice, it made it smooth, it made it uniform. We can write down a very similar equation using the same mathematical machinery, the same mathematical ideas behind it, we can write down the equation for the quantities that describe the geometry of that object. And as we let time flow, that is going to, be, that, that is going to start changing. 
Now the heat equation takes a bad temperature distribution, makes it uniform. Similarly, the heat equation for geometric objects is going to take something like that, something ugly, and gradually make it nice. And to geometers, the nicest thing there is is a sphere. So over time, your bumps are going to flatten, your dents are going to even out, and uh, sooner or later, or at time infinity, you are going to end up with something like this. Now that has been formalized, put into a mathematical proof, and through that, the Poincaré conjecture was actually settled. Now the equation, the heat equation for geometric objects, as I called it earlier, the equation involved is called the Ricci flow. It's a very famous mathematical equation. It's been studied extensively. In particular, it has been studied by several mathematicians at the School of Mathematics and Physics at the University of Queensland, including myself. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Artem. Okay. So our next speaker is Samantha Hood, who is a PhD student in physics at the University of Queensland. And in 2017, she was named as an Australian science superhero by Australia's chief scientist. Not because she wears a cape, although, um, but for her work in quantum physics and her passion for science communication and advocating for women in STEM. So could you please welcome Samantha Hood. Thank you very much, Joel, and thank you all for coming tonight. It's lovely to see so many bright young faces here. Today, I'm very excited to tell you about my research, uh, which is in organic solar cells. My research is inspired by nature for two reasons. The first is that climate change fills me with existential dread, and I want to research technology, such as renewables, that are more efficient and cost-effective that can help us solve this problem. Secondly, organic ce solar cells are inspired by one of nature's most fundamental processes, and this is photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is where plants take carbon dioxide and light and turn this into sugars and oxygen. And it happens around us all, this, all the time. All the flowers that you're holding, they will have been part of plants that do this. But we don't understand how it works on a fundamental level. And it's one of nature's greatest mysteries. And if we could unlock it, it could really help us to solve the problems of climate change. We could create devices that extract CO2 and use light to give us electricity. And this would be a game changer in climate change. But today I'm focusing on organic solar cells. And so these are the things shown here. Um, organic solar cells are essentially the closest thing that we have to artificial plants, essentially. So they're lightweight, they're flexible, and they're also cheaper to produce than conventional solar cells. Organic, in this sense, means they're made up of hydrogen and carbon, and that's kind of different to the one that, ones that you see on roofs, which are made of silicon in general. They can also be printed uh, using exotic inks onto fancy plastics, so that makes them really um, exciting to do large-scale projects with. So uh, they, organic solar cells bring to the table a whole new range of applications, and some of them are shown here. Uh, they can be integrated onto existing technologies um, and also you can put them on the windows of buildings because you don't need to structurally re reinforce uh, the building at all, unlike you with a regular solar panel. You can also make them transparent, which is uh, pretty different and cool too. Uh, they could also be used to power remote areas that have uh, maybe uh, difficulty accessing the grid or in emergency situations. So they have a huge amount of potential. But obviously, we don't see them everywhere around us, so there must be a problem. And this is that they're not as efficient as current solar panels that we do have. And so this is where I come in. I'm trying to understand the theory of how these work so that we can create more efficient and cheaper devices. On a fundamental level, um, this is kind of the schematic of how one of these would work. So we have these organic solar cells, and these are like plastics. So they contain uh, molecules that look like this. Uh, and this is essentially a molecule of plastic. Um, and so this will absorb sunlight. And this absorption of sunlight gives the molecules some amount of energy. 
uh, which I'll call an excitation. This excitation can then diffuse through the material, so it jumps from polymer to polymer until it splits off into charges, and that's what we want. We want these charges because those are, are what gonna, those are what is going to give us our electricity. So this is kind of schematic of how these guys work. But then again, there are so many questions, open questions in this field over the past few decades as to how each of these processes uh, undergoes um, or happens on such a fast time scale. And so this is really exciting. And if we could understand how energy and electrons and charges are transported in these materials, then that would allow us to rationally design better devices to give you cheaper electricity. And one of the main obstacles into, in understanding how these devices work is that they are very messy. So if you were to take one of these and zoom in to the molecular level, they'd, they'd look a lot like spaghetti and meatballs. And so it's a huge mess. And trying to extract meaningful parameters in computer simulations is what I try to do every day. Um, and so things that I might ask myself is, how strongly are the molecules interacting in these materials? And what's my ratio of spaghetti to meatballs, essentially, in these materials? And how long are your excitations living for before they relax back down? And so by combining all these things, I hope to come up with a theoretical model of charge and excitation behavior in these devices. And so far in my PhD, I have solved a nice problem, which is explaining how charges are able to overcome um, a mutual binding that they have. And hopefully, this is a step in creating more efficient devices, which is very exciting. So this brings me back to the problem of uh, not understanding photosynthesis or the underlying physics of photosynthesis. So plants are able to capture sunlight. And then this creates an excitation in the chlorophyll molecule, which is why they are green. And uh, the excitation is able to move throughout the plant in a very, very uh, short amount of time. And we don't quite understand how this works. And one of the reasons behind this is that plants are also biological systems. And they are also very messy at a molecular level, which makes it really difficult to understand them. And so not only do I hope that my research leads to better and more efficient sources of renewable technology, but it may feed back into this problem. So it was inspired by plants, but it may also help us to understand plants. And maybe one day we'll have cool things like this, where you can plug in a light bulb to a plant and power your home. And I think uh, the thing I want to leave you with today is that Australia has the highest solar potential of any continent in the world. And here in the Sunshine State, I think that if we were to make use of solar, we could really get not only environmental gain, but huge economic gains. Earlier this year, there was a study by the University of New South Wales and the Australia, Australian Photovoltaic Institute and they looked at putting solar panels on several buildings in the city. So buildings such as Suncorp Stadium, if you were to cover the area of Suncorp Stadium's roof with solar panels, you could power 800 homes. If you did this on other state-owned buildings, such as QPAC, for example, we could be saving $30 million a year in energy costs. And this is really exciting. On top of this, if we were to use uh, more efficient organic solar cells, the plasticky ones that I research, you could cover the windows of the skyscrapers, skyscrapers in the city, and then you'd have really smart buildings. Um, so, yeah, I hope that my research does uh, lead to better sources of renewable energy and maybe even give us an understanding more of the natural world after being inspired by plants. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Samantha. And our last speaker now is Professor Yerji Filar, who is the director of the Center for Applications in Natural Resource Mathematics within the School of Mathematics and Physics at UQ. Yerji is a broadly trained applied mathematician with research interests spanning a spectrum from both theoretical and applied topics, including game theory and environmental modeling. So to wrap up our round of first, our first round of talks for this evening, could you please welcome Yerji Villa. OK, 
Okay, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I will talk to you about uh, sustainable development. Uh, are most of you in favor of sustainable development? Let's have a show of hands. Seems to be very popular. But what does it really mean? Uh, there are many definitions. Uh, one of the widely used ones is by Paul Hawken, the author of Ecology of Commerce. Here is the definition, uh, and it reads very nicely that sustainability is an economic state where the demands placed upon the environment by people in commerce can be met without reducing the capacity of the environment to provide for future generations. So this is something that is hard to disagree with, but if we try to quantify it and uh, make it a, a little more rigorous, you quickly run into some problems. What does this mean to a lay person? Some sort of stable society uh, that doesn't do any harm to the environment. Uh, what does this imply about production uh, levels, which, which drive the economy? Imagine that you have a population of dishwashers. Uh, must we really strive for uh, zero growth? Uh, mathematically, that would be an equation like that. Uh, uh, undoubtedly, business would argue that this is not development. Uh, uh, so perhaps we should uh, uh, compromise for some moderate rate of growth. But what's moderate? Uh, most economists would say that 3.5% growth is pretty good. Uh, it's hard to get interest in your, in your bank account of, uh, that high, but, uh, 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 but then this equation becomes this, and uh, you get a solution very easily, and this means that uh, the number of, uh, of dishwashers will increase tenfold in, in about 66 years. Is this su sustainable? Uh, if so, for how long? Uh, so, um, for many years now, I've been interested in mathematical concepts that try to address problems of environmental degradation. And I arrived at a kind of notion that I will try to ex very briefly explain today. One is that of a sustain sustainability screw, which I will illustrate in just a moment. And also, I will claim that most of our environmental problems, uh, including pollution and environmental deg degradation, deforestation, uh, climate change are actually m merely symptoms of a more fundamental underlying problem that time scales of human development are out of sync with the uh, time, time scales of the biosphere. So what's uh, sustainability screw? Well, uh, this comes out of a, a larger model which has many variables, but here is the behavior uh, with respect to three variables. M stands for mineral resource, R stands for some renewable resource like water, and Q stands for capital. And under the so-called business as usual scenario, which many environmentalists in, uh, working in climate change consider, you get the spiral, which is like a screw, uh, going down and converging to a, a more or less catastrophic equilibrium where, where, where everything decreases to an unacceptable level. And you can show within this mathematical fr framework that were you to slow down the exploitation of the mineral res resource and uh, speed up the rate of abatement, uh, you could uh, uh, bifurcate the screw and make it uh, converge to something uh, much more acceptable. So that's the sustainability screw. And, but it all depends on importance of time. As I get all the I appreciate the importance of time more and more because there's less and less of it left. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, I'll show you a trick which is often used in, uh, in control theory where you change the time scale. You can stretch time. You stretch time by dividing by a small number. I want to take a very special small, small number, this small number. W uh, why this number? Because with, according with this number, one hour is 31,250,000 years, which means that one day is 750 million years, and six days is four and a half billion years, which is the history of our planet, uh, and since we know that the world was made in six days. Uh, 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 so now you can put the history of our planet on, uh, on, a, on a daily pl uh, uh, planner, 
with the formation of Earth uh, uh, at 12 a.m. on Monday and uh, life in the form of bacteria already arises uh, at 8 a.m. On, on Tuesday. Uh, uh, by Tuesday afternoon, you have blue-green algae. Uh, some of the minerals that we are, the non-renewable minerals that we are busy uh, digging up and exporting, uh, were formed around Wednesday uh, on, on this time scale, uh, Wednesday morning. Uh, for the synthesis that we just heard about, was fully developed by Thursday uh, morning. Amphibians on land by uh, Saturday morning. The period when coal was created uh, also on Saturday. Uh, dinosaurs roamed, roamed the planet for a very long time on, on this time scale, on, almost six hours. That's, that's huge. Uh, uh, primates arose about two hours ago. Uh, us Homo sapiens only six seconds ago. Uh, uh, some of the great religions of, uh, of our civilizations, uh, fractions of a second ago. Uh, industrial revolution started about one fortieth of a second ago, splitting of the atom one two hundredth of a second ago. So you see, in split seconds we are exploiting resources that have been accumulating uh, 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 since Wednesday, right? So that's... Uh, <laughs> That's huge. So, so is this all bad? Can, is, can anything be done? I'd, I'd like to sort of end with a, a provocative idea proposed by an industrialist, uh, uh, Ray Anderson. Uh, he wrote a book called mid Course Collection. He had a sentence that a computer, that's mundane, but a tree, that's technology. A tree operates on a solar energy and lifts water in ways that seem to defy the laws of physics. When we understand how a whole forest works and apply its myriad of symbiotic relationships that will be on the right track. What he means by that is that uh, uh, in a forest you have uh, some species dying, becoming the food for uh, other species, and perhaps with our industrial processes uh, we can also design products that we, uh, we will reuse in, uh, 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 as raw material in other products. Uh, is this extreme environmentalism? Well, perhaps, but it comes from someone who was an industrialist and very successful in making carpets. Uh, he adopted a business model where instead of selling carpets, he would lease carpets so that he could get them back and recycle them. And he's, he's reduced uh, uh, energy consumption in his company dramatically. Uh, he's won many awards uh, as, as being USA's greenest CEO. He also advocated this notion of mining landfills, not the Earth's crust. So I'd like to sort of conclude that to avoid being screwed by the sustainability screw, we should all campaign for synchronization of time skills of human development and natural processes under the campaign, it's the time stupid. Thank you, Yoshi. All right, so on that note, we're going to open up to some questions. So I might invite our panelists to come up onto stage, uh, perhaps bringing your chairs with you. Sorry to make you work even more than you already have to. And uh, we will go to some questions. So if you have questions, write them down on your question slip, or on your bus ticket, or whatever you have. Um, and um, we've got some people in the white bridge science shirts coming down the aisle. Give a moment, I'm just elbowing. Scientist, terrible move. Um, and next month, so next month we have another very special Bris Science because we have the new Dean of Science from UQ coming to speak. That's Professor Melissa Brown. And she's going to be speaking on predicting our future genes and disease risk. Uh, talking about how our genes contribute to the risk of diseases, including breast cancer, and some of her research into BRCA genes, which you might have heard about on the news just recently. So um, that's going to be a really great talk, and Melissa's uh, a really exciting advocate for women in STEM, and uh, really new, exciting things for UQ, so hope to see you all there for that. All right. Everyone comfortable? Great. Um, Okay, so the first question, I, I think it's for Samantha, not from Samantha, is if organic solar cells are less efficient, how much less efficient? Is it a large gap? Right, so can you hear me? 
Yes? Okay. I'm not screaming at you. Um, so organic solar cells, typically now, they can operate at about 13% efficiency um, if you were to have them around your home. And so this means that 13% of the light they capture gets converted into electricity. The ones that you'd have on your roof at the moment are 25%. And while that doesn't seem like a large gap, it does make those cost savings in terms of that efficiency uh, quite a lot. The best solar um, cell in the world now is at about 45%, but this is under lab conditions. So it's always nicer in the lab. Um, but yeah, so that's the difference in those efficiencies. Great. And um, follow-up question, or tangentially related, is what's the next steps for you, particularly since figuring out how to, uh, uh, the, with the molecular work you've been doing? Yes, so I want to think about how uh, to model these at a larger scale. So I've solved some little problems that are going on there, and I'm obviously not the only one working in this field. It's a huge worldwide effort. Uh, but it would be nice to bring in some of the quantum aspects that I have learnt throughout my undergrad. University of Queensland School of Math and Physics has a fantastic quantum uh, focus, I suppose. So to treat this like an open quantum system, essentially, and to get really accurate models of what's happening would be the next step. And I should say, in full disclosure, I did my PhD in biophysics at UQ. Um, so looking at the role of quantum mechanics in biomolecules, which was very interesting and also intensely frustrating because you had to learn both quantum mechanics and some biology. <laughs> Ghastly, don't do biology, terrible field. Um, moving along, <laughs> uh, question for Diane. Why are most shapes in nature curvilinear and soft, whereas we seem to create predominantly along angular straight lines? So um, certainly we create along angular straight lines because we can understand the forces. We actually um, take an object and we define a set of axes. Uh, so we have it in three-dimensional space. And then we can um, write equations mathematically for those forces and we can make balance those forces. So that's why we do it this way, because the mathematics becomes much easier and we can understand it better and we can be sure of our answers. We, we're 100% sure that we've got those forces balanced. Um, why does nature do it differently? Um, I presume natural selection has meant that things have evolved over time differently. What do we need to do mathematically? We need to understand what's going on here. We need to develop the mathematics which can allow us to model this more clearly. And Artem, his um, heat equation is a way of taking a complex idea and simplifying it down into something that we understand. We need to do much more of that mathematically. This is the future. Um, so hyperbolic surfaces have been studied since the early 1800s and that's actually very recent for mathematics if you think about mathematical development, okay? And so what we need to do is put much more effort into understanding these sorts of complex structures so that we can understand what's going on here, develop mathematical equations that we're sure we know the answer because mathematically we need to know it's right. Okay, and that's what ma Artem's mathematica, la mathematics allows us to do. Good. Yeah, is the, um, do you think that the mathematics that we need to model those more arbitrary shapes, are we in a position now with better computing and better mathematics to be able to do more of that in our architecture, or is that still somewhat out of reach? No, I think we're definitely there. Um, we just need to put an effort into it. It's non-trivial mathematics, um, but we need to invest the resources into doing that, mm. and government needs to invest the resources into it as well. Great. All right, a question for Yerji um, from Howard. What is the predicted total population of the world? Uh, and I think it's, that, that can be supported by uh, current systems. Okay. I don't think uh, I know the answer to that. Uh, um, 
th there was a time when uh, pe people claimed that the carrying capacity of the world was much, much less than what it is now. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, some would argue that uh, what I have been presenting is all doom and gloom, but because of technology and uh, innovation, the world can ac accommodate uh, ever-growing population. But uh, uh, the counter-argument is that uh, perhaps one reason why we, we are supporting such a large population right now is because we've, we've been using up credit, in a way. The, uh, all the energy trapped in, uh, uh, in the fossil fuels, the, the coal and the, uh, and the oil, uh, which has been stored in, in the Earth's crust for so long, is now being exploited very fast, and it is used to support this uh, population that is perhaps l larger than it ought to be. Uh, but I don't have a, a number for you. Is there a difference between the short-term limit and the sustainable limit? Oh, I'm sure there is, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, I, I, uh, but, but, but you're saying, well, hopefully we're not uh, past that. Well, actually, uh, there are... Uh, Many researchers, uh, uh, if, you, if you look up in uh, ecological footprint website, uh, people argue that we have already passed uh, 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 the level that uh, our one planet can support. Uh, Anyone else want to add anything to that? I saw some, some nods and some wide eyes. No? Good. Okay. Marvellous. Um, so question for uh, Tim. Um, are there other unsolved problems that mathematicians are looking to other fields for, for inspiration? Oh, well, there are many unsolved problems. <laughs> and uh, wherever you find inspiration to solve them, oh, any source is as good as any other. <coughs> um, I, I'm sure that any of us can name a whole bunch of unsolved problems, um, a lot of them coming out of our own research. Um, there are mathematicians and non-mathematicians who put together lists of unsolved problems, put uh, prizes attached to them. Um, perhaps many people have heard of the famous Millennium Prize problems. I think, uh, what, seven is it? Seven, yeah. That were uh, identified as huge, very significant problems in mathematics, and there is a bounty of $1 million attached to each one. Now, um, the one I was talking about, the Poincaré conjecture, was one of them. And it's actually the only one that, that is solved. Uh, ironically, the guy who, who completed the proof, a whole bunch of people contribute, contributed to it, but uh, there was one guy who actually finished it, and he was offered the million bucks, and he said, I don't want it. Uh, it, it, it it's true, he, he, he just didn't want it. He refused it, he never took it. Uh, not, the, not the money, not the price. So anyway, um, the idea is that, uh, yes, there are plenty of unsolved problems. There are plenty of very important unsolved problems. There is one problem hanging out there which uh, is unsolved. And um, if no, there are a couple of possibilities for a solution, if one possibility turns out to be correct, then we can all say goodbye to all the privacy on the internet, for example, in an email and so on. Or all the, all the nuclear code, all that stuff could potentially be broken as well. So uh, there are many very significant problems and uh, people look all around for inspiration for how to solve them. And as I said, whatever you can find will do. Would you ever take up the quest for one of those unsolved problems? Uh, no, because that would uh, kill my career. <laughs> It's kind of an all-or-nothing type thing, I well, guess. Well, the, the, the guy who solved the, the other thing, um, the, the guy who, who, who settled the Poincaré conjecture, um, there is a reason he, he turned down the million dollars. He, he, he lives with his mother in a small, I think, one-bedroom apartment in Russia, and he's happy that way. No, I, I wouldn't be. Um, and um, no, mo most of us wouldn't be, so most of us uh, will not uh, completely devote themselves to solving one of those problems unless we know that we can get good enough results along the way that we can still sustain our careers. Talk about sustainable development. <laughs> Is there anyone else who'd take up the challenge? There are many mathematicians who work on uh, 
the challenging problems, even if they don't hope to solve them in, in, in their lifetime. They, they can just contribute uh, uh, some stepping stones. And um, also, I, I would challenge Artem. I think he's got those problems in the back of his mind, and he's thinking about them. It's just that there are th other things that he is working on and delivering answers on, but there's those big questions out there. That's the challenge of mathematics. One of the beauties of mathematics is that there's always a question for you to answer. Well, if I bump into a solution to one of those, I'll, I'll uh. pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 you I wouldn't turn down the million. From it, but, um, yeah. Yeah. All right, marvellous. Um, so quest another question for Diane. I don't know if you know anything about this, but I thought it was an interesting one. What are the mathematics behind self-air conditioning termite mounds? Oh, good question. <laughs> oh, what an excellent question. Um, self-air conditioning termite mounds. Right. Okay. Um, no, I'd have to say that I don't know very much about that, but I suppose that... Um, there's some sort of heat conduction going on in these termite mounds which can be modelled and there is some sort of, I would guess, um, holes in their hyperbolic surfaces which allow the air to move through the termite mound and change the heat conduction. So my guess is that if we all put our heads together and thought about it carefully, we might be able to come up with a mathematical model which we could um, run on the computer and see if we could simulate these self-air conditioning termite mounds. <laughs> but otherwise, no, I know nothing about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good answer for that, that final claim. Marvellous. Well, that sounds like a good opportunity for some Googling on your way home. Um, mm -hmm. Question for probably Samantha, but could be um, anyone. What sort of barriers are stopping us from being able to install large volumes of solar panels on notable buildings, as Samantha suggested? How political do you want me to be? <laughs> We're scientists, so um, take it away. Because the so next question is going to follow on that line, so um, Yoshi, be ready. Um. So I think policy is definitely something... Um, that could help uh, see a uh, move towards renewables. The Queensland Government has a goal to be 50% renewable by the year 2030, and so they're getting there. Uh, and despite uh, the slow uptake, perhaps, on the federal level of uh, solar, it is uh, exponential... The solar, anyway, across the whole of Australia is seeing exponential growth, despite the government maybe not being fully invested invested in that so it's essentially at a state level and businesses are realizing that this is a good investment for them to have so that's very exciting uh, but in terms of large uptake of these solar panels on uh, its government-owned buildings that's definitely government policy yeah good answer mm -hmm. All right, so uh, we're almost out of time. So I took one more question just while we're on that political topic um, for Yerji. In your opinion, do the politicians in Canberra know about sustainability screws? And if not, have you spoken to them about it? Uh, uh, um, I, I think the answer is no and no. Uh, um, but uh, uh, I, I think there are some realities uh, of the way economics and politics work that uh, uh, so following on from previous question all political parties in australia realize that the value of coal uh, in australia will drop the price of coal is dropping it will continue to drop so i think mo many people are sort of anxious to dig it out and sell it uh, for what they can get for it as soon as possible. Uh, so there's this haste to, uh, uh, to, cash, to cash in because it's here and, and it may not be worth very much uh, in the near future. Mm. All right. Well, that, that's a, perhaps a more somber note to finish on. 
uh, than we might normally aim for. However, I can safely say that there is food and drink outside, exponentially growing quantities of food and drink that you can wash away your concerns with. But until that point, could you please put your hands together and thank our fantastic panel of speakers tonight, Diane, Yoshi, Samantha, and Artem. Really appreciate your contribution, fascinating stuff, and we'll see you we have a few small tokens. A few small tokens of appreciation from UQ, and please join us outside for food and drinks.